Well, thank you, our uh, Prime Minister and Rector, distinguished guests, for uh, your speeches this morning. And as we're ready for our next session, um, I'm, uh, I was delighted to see um, this title come in from our, our next speaker, because not only does it directly respond to some of the, the central questions and provocations that we have heard this morning and yesterday, but I think that um, the idea of the Belt the Road initiative has been around for you know, five, six years now and is quite a, a, an accepted and understood concept of the reality of, of our age. But this third point in the title, the moorings, whether they be physical, economic, intellectual, is certainly very much still up for discussion. And, um, and therefore, I'm delighted that the person who is uh, going to be talking with us coming next is, uh, is possibly more as qualified as anybody else working on this theme to, to, to discuss it with us today. She's a highly distinguished professor of sociology of education at the University of Cambridge. She's been studying the development of reforms of higher education models around the world since the 1980s. She's the editor-in-chief of Globalization Societies and Education magazine. And I'm sure she will give us plenty of ideas that we can discuss over the next two days and question and beyond this summit over the next 50 minutes. So please join me in welcoming Professor Susan Robertson. Thank you. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the outstanding team of Times Higher, our wonderful uh, hosts, the uh, Republic of Tatarstan, and most particularly the uh, Federal U University of uh, Kazan, Kazan Federal University. It's such a great pleasure to be here with you, um, and thank you, Tim, for the very nice um, introduction. I can't think of a better place to be able to think with you, to encourage you to think with me around uh, the challenges that we're confronting around where to for global higher education. Um, but I also want to, uh, apart from talking about geostrategic uh, developments, the belt and the road, um, and challenges I think that the uh, minister presented us with uh, a little earlier around, well actually, is there any possibility for a future of higher education. I'm going to argue the counter, but I think they are arguments that we need to make. But some of that argument might actually emerge from the idea of um, a long history in higher education, a very, very long history that this part of the world is deeply, deeply aware of. So I'm going to start here with the idea of uh, myths. Global higher education isn't simply something that emerges in the 1980s uh, coined by Roland Robertson uh, in, to actually talk about fundamental changes taking place. I would actually want to argue that uh, the global has been uh, with us for a very long time. Um, if we think of the uh, horizon of action being somewhere out there, I think human beings fundamentally, perhaps part of their DNA, are always mobile, moving out, beyond. It's what the anthropologists tend to study when they actually look at uh, cultures that become more than simply um, groups that are located in one place. But there's a funny trick of memory and of history that now begins to emerge. Because suddenly we have this idea that the university is actually all to do with Europe. Okay? We have the wandering scholars moved between Rome and Paris largely. Some of the wandering scholars got tossed out of uh, Paris and went uh, partly because of what they were preaching, set up the uh, left bank partly because of precisely uh, the knowledges uh, were particularly challenging to the church, uh, but later set up in Oxford, thrown out of Oxford and into Cambridge. So uh, 
But this is a recent history. This is a very recent history in, let's say, uh, the two millennia that the One Belt, One Road is attempting to point to and recover. Take a look at India, part of the One Belt, One Road initiative now. Okay? Nilanda in India, uh, in one of the states of India, in the 5th century AD, actually housed um, more than 10,000 young scholars learning that had come from all over that region to study under something like 2,000 uh, academics. They all boarded. Um, and it is this institution that uh, more recently is, has been renovated, uh, relaunched to join the 21st century. The famous economist Amartya Sen is actually leading the development of the renovation or the renewing of this university. So there's something about mooring and remooring and renovating. Rather than despairing and discarding, there is something important about earlier efforts to engage with the challenge of the development of higher learning okay, and the challenge of the development of methods of curating of a culture, of a society, the knowledges that were important that continue to exist but should be available for the next generation. And here I'd actually point to, um, I've gone a bit close, um, El Elzar in Egypt. Um, here, important uh, activity around the curation of knowledge. And the libraries, particularly here in these institutions, enable us to understand ourselves in relation to our past, our present, and they are the gift to the future generation. So there's something important about the role of um, institutions of higher learning to do with the curation of knowledge as well as the development of the critical faculties of the next generation. But they do take different forms, and they weren't always necessarily tied to the church. And here I'd actually point to the wonderful temple of literature in Hanoi, forgotten uh, in this idea that the university belongs to Europe and modern Europe. The temple of literature in Hanoi, um, as you can see, dates from pretty much the same time as the University of Bologna, and in fact, slightly before. These wonderful um, sculptures of tortoises, which actually is the uh, symbol of Hanoi, um, coming from the lake, inscribed on the back of these tortoises are doctorates. So here is an institution of higher learning uh, a thousand years ago, uh, still exists, it's a, a wonderful place to visit, but the, this was a place where the Mandarinet, which is where we take the term of the Mandarinet from, who actually uh, were key to becoming the civil servants, uh, advising the palace and so on. And these were incredibly important uh, uh, individuals uh, whose art uh, and craft, as it were, would be no different to the civil servants that actually populate our bureaucracies um, um, and so on. Um, and here I would actually think of the quintessential institution, Sciences Po, that uh, in, in Paris, in France, that produces the civil servants to a very high level of um, accomplishment. Move across in the University of Bologna in 1088, and you can see these are enduring institutions. They may have challenges, but they have deep anchors. They may extend out, as does the University of Bologna, into global space. Argentina has a, a branch campus of the University of Bologna in Argentina. So, uh, Older institutions have understood the challenge of becoming global institutions. They have uh, looked at uh, rival institutions uh, and the ways in which they've engaged in the 21st century, um, developed uh, new kinds of uh, institutional structures that extend out into global space. Argentina's an awful long way 
from Italy. Um, at the same time, it enables, I think, a continuation of a commitment to higher learning that is at the heart of uh, everything that we've heard both yesterday and today here in Kazan. So these were towns and cities that were connected by an old Silk Road um, and in more recent times, uh, older and new newer forms of empire building. Uh, where I grew up in Australia, in my early years, I would have semi-understood that I belonged to an extension of the empire of Great Britain. Um, Alan uh, Lau, yesterday presenting from Swinburne University in Australia, you get a very distinct sense that Australia is now no longer a part of the OECD countries, an extension of the empire connected to the British Empire, but firmly in Asia. And indeed, in the new Silk Road, to a large extent, the, the Belt and Road Initiative that I'll get onto, um, those parts of the world, Australia particularly, Singapore, Malaysia, and so on, parts of older empires, have now been connected in quite important ways into the Asian region. So we had not only institutions, but we had important movements of scholars, knowledge, forms of higher learning, innovation taking place um, both historically and moving these into the present. I want to take you to my own institution, uh, Cambridge, a kerfuffle, uh, a major kind of fracas in Oxford and the scholars uh, were thrown out. But this was highly problematic. Many of the cities, the old cities, like here in Kazan, understood very clearly that hosting a university meant also a means of local economic development. Just as governments nowadays understand that uh, visiting students or international students are significant forms of investment that even include when their uh, parents and grandparents following the student come and visit them. The Australian government, for example, calculates those movements. These institutions have always, Bologna particularly, um, as, a, as a, a, a university in a city, uh, Oxford, Cambridge and so on, have understood absolutely clearly that having a university, and more than that, a world-class university in their city does something for their city. Okay? It puts their city on the global map. It essentially generates uh, local economic development. Students, academic staff, they require housing. They eat. Uh, they have cultural uh, elements of their life. They have children that go to school. So I would actually say institutions like universities deeply, deeply more. They anchor um, the institution uh, very firmly into the bedrock of that place. And that's not to say that those places like Cambridge uh, don't face major challenges. Indeed, they do, and they look across the water to some extent to the new and rather different ways, for instance, Stanford University has had to uh, rethink the way in which it engages with the wider uh, ecosystem, in this case, Silicon Valley, uh, how uh, it uh, works with its young scholars in the various uh, departments and faculties within Stanford, uh, but then actually connects them out into the ecosystem looks at ways of generating new products. For example, venture capital uh, wasn't actually something, a financial product that was uh, particularly well known until Silicon Valley really gets going. And here what we have is quite a complex ecosystem that actually, if you study as uh, the uh, Annalise Saxenian has, uh, the new Argonauts, what she begins to show here is that also the companies themselves uh, in Silicon Valley also began to think of different ways of working with each other. A contract, for example, would never actually go to one company. It would be half a contract. And this would be an interesting thing for uh, Kazan to actually think about as part of its development strategy. The idea here would be that actually firms always had let's say, never 360-degree vision around uh, where their blind sides were. 
So one of the uh, elements that uh, was particularly important to generating the success of Silicon Valley was actually a very interesting learning model that worked between the university, but particularly between the firms in Silicon Valley, where essentially it then positioned Silicon Valley to ultimately compete with MIT, uh, what was known as Route 128. But there have been important ruptures in the sector. And, and this is actually the more, and let's take it forward to the more recent period of globalization. Higher education is seen by governments as a, a really important uh, sector, services generating sector. So they would measure the movements of international students, calculate that. Uh, the Australian government does that par excellence, New Zealand as well, to the point that for the Australian government, it is the fourth largest income earner in GDP terms, the sale of education services. Mostly, but not exclusively, undergraduate students uh, finding that it's not easily feasible to get places in their own home uh, institutions or, or, or countries. Um, and the Australian government has, uh, in, in a very um, important way, um, developed all kinds of intelligence systems to feed back the health of the uh, growth of that sector. But there are um, challenges that then are presented to countries around the integration of quite large populations of international students. You could wander around the city of Auckland and wonder whether, in fact, you weren't in a part of Asia. House prices have gone up significantly. Locals sometimes feel they're being pushed out. I could give you a similar story in relation to Hong Kong. Movements of students across the borders, uh, partly because being mobile actually has some kind of currency. And yet, at the same time, there are unmoorings, kind of dis equilibria kind of setting in in these cities as uh, essentially you have concentrations of populations um, and the figure is something in the order of 60% of the international students, mostly from the Asian region, uh, end up in Auckland. And that's quite dramatically changed the cityscape. So on the one hand, they are welcomed. On the other hand, you'll have uh, indigenous populations actually asking where do they fit in this new landscape. And these are important challenges for governments and policymakers as they set sail, as they move forward um, along a new belt and a new road and attempt to remoor the project in rather different ways. Nin uh, 2013 um, was quite an important year, not least because the One Belt, One Road strategy was actually launched, but uh, we also had uh, Similar kinds of ideas. Uh, here we've got the avalanche uh, is, uh, is, is coming um, and uh, Michael Barber, who was the architect or the writer along with the team, uh, launched this for the IPPR, a uh, think tank in, uh, in England. And the idea here essentially is that universities uh, now facing the world are actually facing the possibility of their own distinction. What are they talking about? They're talking about the emergence of new digital platforms, uh, new players in the sector, uh, the idea that actually what you don't necessarily need is to go to a university. The uh, Clayton Christensen, who uh, writes a lot on creative destruction and disruptive technologies, um, actually argued that short of a few hundred institutions around the world that would be mega global institutions, uh, essentially the rest of the world, uh, the, the higher education world in terms of their infrastructures would have actually vanished and given ground to these new digital platforms, massive open online courses and so on. Some of the pundits at the time basically said they would disappear. We've always had technology, it will disrupt the sector, but essentially the, uh, the oldness, the weight of age, the history of these institutions will be on their side and they will continue. I think that is the case that they will continue, but my sense is to look inside, to look at uh, the possibilities, and I will, I will kind of move there toward the end of my talk, um, but there are opportunities, I think, that uh, the fourth 
uh, industrial revolution, if we want to uh, take that metaphor, offers us both possibilities and uh, potential cautions about how we enter into that world. Um, the idea of a complete kind of devastation, I think, is uh, not on the cards, but that we will actually be moving in, in precisely the same way, but also at the same pace of the development of universities like Cambridge, 800 years. Um, it's quite confronting if you go to Peru and you realize Cambridge is older than the Incas. The Inca Empire, 1400s, Cambridge, 1200s. Okay, it's outlived the Incas, even indeed go to Mexico and the Aztecs. But it will not be the same, it will not look the same. And it will not look the same for reasons like this. There's an ambitious, a very ambitious strategy launched by President Xi Jinping uh, in 2013. The One Belt, One Road. The old Silk Road is now a new belt. The new roads, uh, the, the, new, uh, the new roads are actually some of the port uh, infrastructures, um, the maritime connections that you can see here. Tatarstan is bang in the middle um, here uh, between the so-called east and the west. Um, and most recently, or earlier this year in May, I was invited to the celebration of Peking University's 120 years, simply a, a, a little one, really, if we think of actually um, the University of the Federal University of Kazan, uh, which is 1804. So you're much older, um, or almost as old as as, as that. In, no, not quite as old actually um, as that institution. My reading as a as a uh, kind of a scholar of higher education, but with a deep interest in politics, has been that China herself has been quite thwarted around the regional strategies, the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, it deliberately from the US side, excluded China. This was to be a game that essentially was making China to be a rule taker rather than a rule maker. Um, China has had a kind of uh, engaged but rather peripheral relationship, uh, an on-off sort of relationship with the ASEAN regional agreements and so on. So it has gotten going on its own strategy and potentially on its own terms, um, and it's an ambitious strategy. And as Max Weber, the famous sociologist, will tell you, all uh, developments, particularly around uh, capitalism, particularly in the expansion of markets and so on, requires infrastructures. And this is a big and very ambitious uh, infrastructure that is being launched. It is a new regional growth strategy uh, that enables uh, China to connect back to this historic past. Okay? Uh, it has, and it points to the diligent and courageous people across Eurasia who explored and opened up several routes of trade and cultural exchanges that linked major civilizations of Asia, Europe, and Africa, collectively called the Silk Road. And this may well be a mechanism to bring Africa in because essentially Africa, in many of our accounts of the expansion of higher education, absolutely falls short. We might look at the Latin American world, Mercosur, um, Alba and many of those with the BRICS, uh, but the African part of the world is actually um, largely ignored. So is this a new world of higher education? Is this the century of uh, the Asian uh, awakening, the stirring of the lion as the uh, Chinese president uh, has launched it? Most certainly it is China declaring that it will no longer want to suffer what it called the century of humiliation, and I think it's absolutely right there. So is the genie out of the bottle, and what's in Pandora's box? In other words, what new challenges um, are on the table, and what new directions and movements are we actually uh, seeing? One of the things we can see, if we're looking at the 1990s quite quickly, is we saw a rapid expansion of students going to OECD countries. Education sectors were included as parts of uh, the trade figures. Uh, uh, if you know New Zealand, it's the third largest income earner over and above wine, which is uh, New Zealand wine is known all over the world. Growing numbers of branch campuses, but hang on. Who's turned up in Oxford? There's a branch of Peking University. 
So there's an uh, older uh, branch campuses from places like Malaysia had moved themselves into parts of Africa. There had been across Europe the standardization from the Bologna ar um, architecture and uh, regional agreements like ASEAN um, into the Latin American world, Mercosur, uh, and, and so on, um, as well as the rise of global quality assurance data. But if we go to the right-hand uh, column here from 2000 on, but particularly 2010 onwards, what we see are declining populations um, both in the East and the West, which will actually set up new kinds of challenges. Japan, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, Hong Kong, all have um, uh, reproduction rates of young babies uh, that sit, sits at about 0.8. Okay? So all of those places are actually looking out to internationalize and to uh, recruit uh, the future workers learners and workers for their population. So this is going to quite radically um, multiculturalize their populations in ways in which the expansions of their higher education sectors will also need to be very, very attentive to what happens as in Auckland, you get expansions of uh, groups from other parts of the world and how best to integrate them. Singapore knows this only too well, a very rapid expansion under the Global Singapore Schoolhouse Initiative, uh, very large numbers, it went from almost none to quite close to uh, something about 80 odd thousand uh, students and this is actually a very significant number if you think that uh, somewhere in the order of about 800,000 international students turn up in the United States. So given the size of Singapore and housing that number of students there is quite challenging. But if you actually uh, look at the figures, and uh, this is where I think data is important, um, and, uh, the ch and, and using those figures to actually look beyond the story of the success of the internationalizing of students to Europe, is that you can actually see a counterflow. Uh, the US-based students, maybe they're in study abroad uh, programs and so on in China, but nevertheless they are the second largest population to turn up studying in China, okay? along with African students. And that number will set to rise, particularly as uh, American families uh, wonder and think themselves geostrategically and also economically about where's the best future for their child. Where will the jobs be? Um, in a ma moment of folly, I would want to argue, the UK government uh, put out a very strong proposal that they would be the magnet economies. So it would be the Asian world that would be doing the laboring and the high uh, in skill value added would take place in places like the UK and so on. But the UK at the moment is beset by problems to do with immigration, letting international students come in, um, international students feel as if they're not welcome because of the way in which the politics around uh, immigration um, policies are actually um, being kind of played with international students are included as the migrant uh, numbers in the UK. And this is having quite devastating effects on uh, our capacity actually in the UK to stay both in the game and potentially ahead of the game. At the same time, China and uh, Singapore, Malaysia, all of those countries, and indeed here in uh, Kazan and universities, so Tatarstan and Kazan, they have percentages of international students that they would actually want to ultimately do what uh, John Henry Newman had as the idea of the university. It is a universe. It is a coming together of the knowledges of the world. Uh, but it will require quite important, hard, thinking um, and not simply just ramping up figures about how do we integrate different cultures um, and ways in which we show that we value, value the knowledges. So this will require, it seems to me, um, some ways not only of thinking of those challenges, but which kind of uh, model for development. Uh, one of the things that I think characterizes the beginnings of the 2000s is that we can actually see interesting kinds of experiments across the Gulf world, for example, Dubai, uh, you could go to Saudi, for instance, uh, Oman, another place, um, Singapore, 
all of them have been experimenting, not with a slow growth, several hundred years, if not 800 years, uh, institutional development model, but a different way in which you could actually partner, let's say, with the best in the world, have exchanges, and if we take the Singapore Global Schoolhouse there uh, as an example, it has invited in bits of the best of universities from around the world. Quite a strong level of state monitoring around the delivery of quality, but this is an interesting uh, way in which you can, in the case of Singapore, uh, grow quite dynamically in a very short uh, period of time. And um, we have then the mixing of you know, very high levels of, of, of knowledge and for the for Singapore, it's an attempt to also stem the flow out of some of their uh, people who went to study elsewhere, but also to bring the brightest and the best uh, into Singapore. It's not plain sailing, and it rubs up sometimes uh, and finds itself very destabilized by um, politics. But this is actually where politics and the economy would actually need to begin to think together. If I go on. So there are new, uh, thinking about that disruptive dynamics, nevertheless, um, that I actually also want to point to. Um, we often think of the sector as a rather coherent sector, put the university in the middle, and we don't actually think of all the different and quite innovative ways those who are in that ecosphere, the higher education ecosphere, are actually thinking in very imaginative and creative ways about them themselves entering into the sector. The students that did MOOCs, and uh, for my sins, actually, uh, in 2014, uh, with my colleague Chris Olds, we actually developed and ran a MOOC. We had 18,000 students in our class. But any of those students now who could get a, uh, a certificate of participation can actually now say that they would actually potentially like to take out their certificate as what is actually being called a micro credential. Okay. So many of us thinking about Bologna think of three years, two years, three years. Okay. What do we do with micro-credentials? And how do micro-credentials, or we could use another term, nano-credentials, how do we add one, two, three micro-credentials and what's called stackability and get something that's a set of competences for, let's say, a company like Siemens? Would they be interested? Maybe. Uh, partly as it seems to me the micro-credentials now have the possibility of enabling, let's say, uh, a, a scientist, perhaps a, a theoretical physicist, to actually maybe gather, or potential young theoretical physicist, to gather particular knowledge as maybe in the social sciences world. Steve Jobs, if he was standing here, would say that actually his technology did the engineering second and the aesthetics first. Okay? So, what are we actually doing inside our own institutions to actually begin to think uh, as to what that kind of challenge might mean? Let's go to the right, uh, blockchain. What's the challenge here? MIT, for example, at the moment in the United States is actually uh, enabling every individual student to encrypt their credential unique to them on a blockchain. Um, what will this do to how we actually think both of uh, the movements potentially of students? So this now frees up once we go with micro-credentials, not all of our degree being necessarily located in one place. And then it raises the interesting question of how do we credentialize? Who will be the credential credentializing agency? We're not short of particular uh, companies. Pearson, for example, has been particularly interested in maybe playing that kind of role. Other game changers. Most of you uh, can't have avoided some kind of bumping into uh, one of a number of different firms. LinkedIn is a good example. It was the largest uh, tech uh, buy-up um, by Microsoft uh, several years back. Uh, and LinkedIn essentially here is uh, engaged in really what it sees as uh, thinking about employability and, th and, and thinking with um, students who are in universities uh, and ways in which they actually might begin to think about who do they need to know, 
what are the nature of the skills that they've acquired and how do they actually think about where they actually go into the future, what kinds of jobs, and then jobs are being kind of sent to them. Historically, this was our career services in the university. Um, but if we actually now go to the right, there's a new competitor on the block, Google for Jobs. Google has announced most recently that it's actually in using machine learning and artificial intelligence to uh, be the uh, biggest broker in the world for thinking about how uh, students, particularly in our case, or academics, um, see their credentials and uh, they can be the object of where are the jobs and, and, and so on. Will this make uh, movement into jobs and movement to and from jobs, in and out of jobs, uh, quicker? I, I don't know, but these will be very interesting kinds of uh, developments. So over the last day uh, and today, we've heard a lot about the way in which we engage with the wider industry. But I guess my question and my challenge to us here today is to think about the way in which the new digital technologies, University 4.0, if we want to put it that way, will actually, to some extent, um, pull away some of the historic uh, responsibilities from the university around careers, employability, and so on. Um, and some of these are actually being picked up and being picked up by new players in the sector. And quite a bit of my own recent research has been to um, not just look at the obvious player like the university, but the myriad of many players uh, in the sector who have got uh, products to sell, uh, mobility um, experiences to sell to students, credit to lend to students. Uh, you could actually go right out there into peer-to-peer -peer lending and the student lending market, for example, actually has investors here and a student who wants to take out a loan here, and the bank is actually now gone. Okay? Uh, we can actually see uh, not just uh, crowdfunding, but, uh, or, but crowdfunding for funding research projects. Again, this will turn the university inside out as many of these new platforms, um, what we might call the platform university, as a potential contender. Um, as one of the potential kind of players now in this new world. To what extent will the One Belt, One Road provide a space for invention, innovation, experimentation across the Belt and Road as uh, older institutions actually maybe willingly grasp the possibilities that the new technologies uh, actually put on the table for uh, enabling uh, a rapid reinvention, a kind of, a, a kind of an unanchoring and a new mooring in different kinds of ways. So how do we um, manage the new challenges? And I've got two to three uh, thoughts, uh, several slides here. One is building or renewing. So how do institutions build or renew? Um, and I would say the um, Federal University of Kazan is um, absolutely impressive in what it's up to. Um, building a new brand in the context of both uh, a, a, a nation, but actually the possibilities of new strategic uh, spatial developments, one belt, one road. But without losing sight of local priorities, and that's actually some of the challenge. How do they recruit and retain international faculty and students and generate an imaginative and curiosity-driven culture without creating different tiers? And that's one of the problems when you get these different uh, uh, faculty who, uh, and we see to some extent some of the, uh, the uh, Gulf universities kind of struggling with this. How do they manage partnerships and collaborations which respect distinct institutional cultures, but ensure the distinctiveness of the local and the national? How do they bring in excellent teaching, research, innovation, and engagement, and what does that begin to look like? It's the last bit of that is something that universities historically have not done and uh, particularly well. How do they take the best of the new digital technologies and be attentive to the overall need to put these to the use of excellence? engage with the, the wider local economy, and at the same time, and this is very important, manage academic freedom. How do they, to some extent, avoid the Wild West? 
what conditions would need to be in place so that the promise of the, in this case, in this part of the world, the one belt, one road, that of the east and the west, deliver and the promise of the, uh, the, the one belt, one road, is multipolarity. Okay? This idea that there's not one single European image of what's the best university, but actually there's a proliferation of possibilities, which has to be the only way forward. Um, how do we actually make sure government policies are in place to ensure that the sector as the whole benefits from investing in the best and not so simply the, the kind of the elites, which has actually historically been a problem for the universities, um, that they actually do ensure that higher education benefits from the technological advances and uses data well. And I've just kind of left, um, these are my thoughts about the university is at its best. Uh, when they're open-minded, when they're imaginative, they're outward-looking and have excellence built into everything that they do. That they value plurality and dialogue, not only within the, the academy but with their wider communities and societies. And finally, that they do understand their mandate to create, to circulate, to curate um, esoteric and practical knowledges and engage the next generations in this societal, important societal purpose. So in closing, I believe there is an important place for the university into the future, but it will require, it does, some re-anchoring and some re-mooring. And when it's attentive to that task, it will have another century at least ahead of it. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, I have a very um, basic metric of assessing quality in terms of the number of people taking pictures of slides and there were pretty much everybody was taking photos all through your presentation as a guide of how good that was. We've got um, some time on the clock now for questions. I've got questions of my own, but before I start, can I just ask, is there anybody who wants to immediately um, take up some of the challenges that, that Susan just posed? Or are you going to think? I would like, therefore, to ask your last point about data, mm -hmm. um, which is obviously the dominant currency of our, of our lives, almost our modern economies now is a surveillance economy. Within a university context, I mean, how do you feel like that's almost a, a new digital divide, the, the, the universities, the institutions that have got access to, to student data, even perhaps to faculty data? Is that going to be the new the new driver of, of universities that, that can use that effectively to, to really accelerate their, their progress and accelerate towards their missions against those that don't have the access or don't understand how to use it properly? How, how can that change a university's um, position? Okay. So my sense is that data by itself, we can have good and bad data. Um, so the question, it seems to me, is what kind of data are we collecting and what are we using it for? So my thought then really about data is it's absolutely crucial. Uh, we use data, uh, our teaching excellence framework data comes back to us, let's say, at the University of Cambridge. And we think um, about why is it that, let's say, students are happy, not happy, want to be challenged further and so on. So quite often I would probably say, and particularly around teaching and learning, uh, they've often been closed classroom spaces. You know, we get a sense, you know, if a student walks past me and says, that's fabulous to my lecture, I think, ha, huh, thank you. But short of that, often we haven't had, I think, good data. Uh, now, it's not to say universities haven't done evaluations, but some of the evaluations actually you would actually want to put to the side. You know, an evaluation that says, I wish my lecturer would wear, you know, more trendy clothes, actually doesn't really tell you much about you know, the quality of the teaching and learning. And to be honest, that's been some of the kind of um, data that you might have gotten back, you know, in universities where I've seen student evaluations. Um, but it is important that we both collect data, but then use data kind of sensibly to think about uh, what can be done, how do we use that to plan forward, you know, we don't just do what we've always done because that's what we've always done and so on. So, sure, we live in a world of data, but can we, can we make sure that we understand the kind of questions that generated that data? the kind of questions that we actually want then to pose of that data, uh, then it seems to me that the way in which we'd use that data to you know, both 
diagnose the problems and then look at where we might get a year from now and two years from now and so on. And would you foresee that that data should be used and retained by the institution for its personal development and performance decision making? Or do you think that there could be a uniformity of data within a national system, for example, so that students or prospective students or faculty could... could you, is it possible to have data that's relevant across, in a UK context, an institution like Cambridge and Equal University of Hull, which is, um, which is lower down the rankings for, for people who aren't But it's more or less up the road from Cambridge, yeah. as, it, as it were. Um, these are different kinds of institutions, and one of the problems, it seems to me, that uh, when we put, let's say, uh, institutions into some kind of ranking. And, uh, and, and I think the Times higher has actually tried to differentiate different types of institutions for different kinds of histories and so on. Um, it's simply not possible to, let's say, compare the student of, uh, uh, the experience of a student are at Hull. Uh, it may well be a particularly um, wonderful experience. But let me just give you an example of Cambridge. If I give a lecture, a student is entitled, funded by the college, to have one hour of tutoring around the lecture that I give. And that would apply to all of the lectures. So now we've got two rather differently resourced experiences for students. So what we would need to do would be to make sure that we're actually using uh, data sets of equivalences, not um, quite different kinds of institutions with different intakes, different mandates, and so on. So wisdom around the use of data, I think, um, and wisdom on the part of our institutional um, senior administrators, you know, um, is important. Um, we've got a question I saw from the um, president of the University of Tehran. Is, is there, I think there's a microphone just coming, one sec, because we'll record it. Thank you very much, Suzanne Vici. She, she reviewed the history of uh, universities. I first have a comment and want to enrich this uh, review that the oldest university in the world was the John de Chapur 70, 100 years ago. And it was interesting that it's a complex university and it has the all elements of the modern universities. And may I have asked you about the few, how to link the future of universities to the social, their social responsibility, how their contribution on the development of regional and international could be in the future, uh, impact on the future of the universities? That's an excellent question, and I appreciate uh, that, and partly because this is actually the challenge for our discussions both today and tomorrow. Um, Perhaps the idea of the mooring, you know, a ship moors, and it's very easy to kind of be seduced by the global and think that your circuit is um, beyond the, the local population. You know, the, uh, in the case of the UK, it would be Oxford, Cambridge, the Russell Group, the Ivy League, and so on. But there are deep responsibilities to local communities um, that I believe that uh, universities at their best understand and recognize. And actually, to be fair, if I look at uh, the University of Cambridge, there's a serious amount of uh, investment in uh, local and regional uh, development. Uh, but you asked the question about the social. Um, and here, that would be an interesting question about who, in the case of uh, the local population ends up going to Cambridge. I mean, is there a, a mechanism, let's say, of, for elite institutions to make sure that um, students who live in that region actually also have a fair enough chance to turn up in Cambridge? Uh, universities like Oxford and Cambridge are deeply aware of that and of the challenge of that, and there are quite interesting uh, innovations, let's say, at the University of Bristol, where I was, um, of identifying, let's say, high school students with promise but never the kinds of resources that families from more well-off homes would be able to put into them and have actually got quite an interesting uh, program bringing those young students through that university. So the idea that actually the brains, the knowledge, the, 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 the capabilities or the possibilities to become someone because you are bright enough but you now need a bit more institutional uh, wisdom to identify bright students in local uh, communities that may not have had ambitions to go to the universities. The responsibility 
as both Cambridge, Oxford and cities like Bristol recognise it is their responsibility to do something about that. Uh, we've got a question from um, at the back. different university level interactions, you particularly mm -hmm. this triangular model where you had the, the groups coming together. I would like to put it as a question, to an extent, not just about education now, but an, an, you know, we're a research and innovation hub as part of the title. You know, much of what I would tell you at a micro level, the individual academic level, we, we sort of do that anyway, right? I mean, that's what we're doing. And is this, so what the question I'm like, is the desire to assess universities and rank universities on numbers, maybe losing us some of what our academics can do in terms of, you might be at, you know, ranked, you know, 689 university, but you're interacting with people in different units to provide not just the deliverance of knowledge, but the creation of new knowledge in those networks. And that we need, we also need at some point to recognize, and I don't know how you do this, you know, recognize that the, the value that academics can do in their interactions and how they make this global interaction of de generation of knowledge important. And I see a lot of that you know, here within in Russia too. Yes, I mean, you're absolutely right. One of the problems if we go to what I would kind of, you know, let's say, forms of ranking is that we, we lose the granu granuality of things. And um, the only way you could get that back, it seems to me, would be to uh, absolutely ensure that the incentive structures in institutions um, then begin to value certain things. So if what's valued, and I believe it should be valued, um, connections with the industry, and they could be all kinds of connections. If you're uh, in a faculty of education, this may well be schools in the wider community. Okay. Um, you may well be an engineer, but this might well mean, you know, Microsoft and whoever else, but even local engineering firms and so on. Um, in the UK, I would say that the so-called engagement and impact agenda has tried to pick that up and that is also now built into the promotions systems and the systems of recognition. So you can be a more esoteric uh, researcher, um, but there's huge incentive now for you to begin to think um, about how you engage and communicate um, your science to that wider public. Um, and I had the great privilege of having a conversation with you uh, last evening uh, uh, about these issues. Um, how do s scientists, uh, of social scientists, scientists, natural scientists, how do we, and this is a challenge, the more we ask for taxpayers' money uh, or the backing of government, we actually have a responsibility to communicate our science to our local communities, to our national communities, and to our global communities. Now, they may well be different kinds of genres of communication, but that is, I, I, I would want to say, something that distinguishes the Humboldt notion of the university, the German model of the university, the university and research connected to that wider community that funded many of the, that was the model of the state universities in the United States, versus the idea that you remain cloistered, which is the Newman idea, inside the university and it was your state of higher becoming. Um, my sense is uh, maybe the state of higher becoming is you want that space to think about fundamental questions, blue sky research and so on, but a Newman scholar needs to become a Humboldtian scholar and actually see a responsibility to producing knowledge for the wider community and not for an internal audience. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm very sorry, but we've run out of our scheduled time for this particular session. Um, but we are going to go into a, a half hour coffee break. So I'm sure that um, we'd love to have continue these conversations over a drink. But please join me in thanking again. Thank you. Greatly, Professor Thank you. Susan Robertson. Thank you.